Well, welcome everybody. Um, this evening's artist lecture is titled Latitude by Bryce Pettit. Uh, Bryce is a wildlife sculptor that we've been working with here at Blue Rain Gallery for two and a half years. Uh, Bryce is uh, based out of Colorado and his sculptures range from playful wall installations that sometimes show the pattern of migration with butterflies and birds uh, to uh, sculptures in the round that are standalone and spare no detail. Uh, I really appreciate the way that Bryce approaches his sculpture. Uh, he brings together uh, realist sculpting tendencies with, uh, with really interesting conceptual ideas. Bryce has now been a professional sculptor for over 20 years. Uh, he has created several large-scale public works, including pieces for the Tulsa International Airport, the Maritime Museum in Ludington, Michigan, the Nyana Kai Botanical Gardens in Kauai, Hawaii, and I'm sure I butchered the name of that. Uh, and he's also uh, done some large-scale works for libraries and schools around the country as well. Thank you all again for being here this evening. I'm going to turn the mic over to Bryce without any further ado. And um, here's Bryce Pettit. Thank you, Denise. Um, I, I love to talk to people, and I love to talk to people about my art. Um, so I was excited about the opportunity. I'm a little intimidated by the microphone and the, and the lights and all that. I wish we could just kind of chat here, but I'll pretend like this doesn't exist because that's, that's the format in which I'm most comfortable in talking to people. Um, and I'm really, you know, proud to be here in this gallery with people that really do care about good art and a gallery that is such a beautiful space to exhibit my work. Um, well, so the, as Denise said, the title of my my chat tonight is Latitude. And many of you may be familiar with uh, the series that I have called Latitude. Latitude is a name I've given to a lot of these pieces that are hanging on the wall. The butterflies, the hummingbirds, the swallows. Many of you are either collectors of those pieces or have seen them or are familiar with them. Um, the concept for me of the Latitude series began with trying to pare the sculptures down to just their most essential form, to just, to just having that be only about the animal or only about the motion of the piece. And hopefully with that paring down, the, the impact of it is even greater. Um, in sculpture, as with everything, you know, one of my major limiting factors is gravity. So it has to be able to balance in some way. Um, and, and so I'm always fighting with ways to make something look like it's in motion, but still be stable, but still be able to be supported where it's at. Um, when I first started sculpting, I sculpted it in wood and I sculpted in stone. Um, and with both of those materials, those are just, I, I can never remember a time in which I wasn't doing art. I've always grown up doing art. And so stone and wood were probably the most accessible materials. But with both of those materials, one of the things that I ran into is that you have to be always working with the material instead of creating whatever it is that you can imagine. When you're doing a stone carving, you, it's actually very fragile and you have to have it be supported in a certain way and remove the material in a very organized process. With wood carving, you have to work with the grain, you have to have the strength of it. So these are some of the Latitude series, the butterflies, the hummingbirds. Now, this is one of my early wood sculptures. I'm not going to leave it on here very long because I'm embarrassed to show you this, but it, it's just kind of one of my early pieces that I did with wood carvings, just sort of having to work with the detail there. Well, thank you. So, um, going back to the pieces I like better. <laughs> All right, so I did wood carving and bronze, or wood carving and stone carving, and um, felt limited always by the materials. So when I first discovered bronze casting, it really opened this entirely new world you know, to me to be able to create anything that I could see, anything that I could imagine. You, you have 
um, the strength in the material so that it can support itself just on the wing tips like this bird or or a small point you can do any sort of form that doesn't have to be larger at the bottom and go to the top it can the strength of the materials the the ability even in the sculpting to sculpt with clay and to add and subtract the clay to the form to change your mind to move it all around um, that really opened up everything for me the first bronzes I did, I got still so wrapped up from the details that were part of the stone that I really felt like I had to do everything. Um, this is one of my early bronze sculptures in which I, had to, I felt like I had to do all the trees, I had to do the mountainside, I had to do all of that to really place it in a setting. Um, and at some point I began to realize that what I was creating was probably more of a model than a piece of art. And that got me thinking about the idea of paring the composition down. So what I started to do is eliminate all the details and focus just on the form. And so instead of having the piece be, the animal be a portion of the composition, the animal itself became the composition. Every dynamic line was part of the animal itself. Um, and I feel like for me that the sense of motion is better conveyed um, you know, by those single lines within the animal instead of having all the detail. Thank you. <laughs> so I brought this, people, this piece and a couple of people have mentioned it. This is a piece I call To and Fro, um, which is sort of fun for me because I've looked up the etymology of the word swallow. These are barn swallows. And in Gaelic, the word swallows came from a word that means to and fro. And I thought that was just absolutely perfect for swallows. This is my personal copy, and it's a piece I did a while ago. It's actually a sold out edition, but it's still one of my very favorites that I've hung on to. This was kind of a turning point piece for me. I'll put it up on the screen here, too. Is that? Oh, sorry. Elk is sold out no, I have the elk as well. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I keep forgetting the slides. I really can't multitask very well. Okay, okay. so here's another example of the motion and the composition being contained completely within the piece. No longer is the animal a feature or a, a, a space along the composition lines, but it is the composition. And the turn of the ear, the, you know, the position of the legs, all of it makes part of the, the composition itself. Um, Okay, back, oh, sorry, keep going. There's another one where the composition is all within that piece. Um, and here we are to to and fro. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, so to and fro is, like I said, a, a, one of my earliest ones in which I started to completely pare down the composition to the animal by itself. Um, this started, I was, uh, standing on a bridge and looking down over the water, a river flowing below me, and seeing swallows swoop in around the bridge. And I just love animals, I love what they convey, and I just was so um, enthralled by this, this wonder I was feeling that I wanted to try and to put that into a sculpture. And for the first time I realized I don't, I can't make the swallow look like it's flying. I can't make the, the river there. Uh, what I can do to convey that feeling is just to have just the swallows just suspended by the tips of their wings. And by doing that, then the tabletop, that becomes the river. The motion is all right there within it. And, um, and with a lot of my pieces now, I, I rarely do any sort of base at all. You know, the red-tailed hawk here or any of the other birds, they're just standing by themselves and hopefully that's stronger and more impactful by being simplified. Okay, so after, compo after um, kind of condensing the composition into the animal itself, one of the last places I was able to go was then off the pedestal. And so that is what led to the Latitude series. Nowhere to go but up. So, so then I decided to, to try and cheat gravity just a little bit and have it be on the wall instead of just on the pedestal. Um, 
The other way that the Latitude series began for me um, is credited to um, my sweetheart, Allison. She did it, she's a very accomplished oil painter. If you don't know her, she is a very worthwhile person to get to know. Um, she painted a painting of, a, of butterflies in a frame and asked me to sculpt for her a single butterfly to place just outside like it, it had escaped out of the frame. And so I did this for her and because the casting process has a million different ways in which it can go wrong, I usually will cast a couple. So I cast a couple butterflies and I said here's your butterfly and I gave that to Allison and she said oh I, th I think I want all three of those and so <laughs> uh, and so she, <laughs> she liked the idea of a small grouping and so looking at the small grouping of the butterflies that had much more impact than this single little butterfly that I had sculpted and it quickly became easy to see or to kind of get the idea or the excitement for what would it look like if we did more and more and do larger compositions of those. So the butterflies started as a small grouping. They developed into these large installations, largest being one we did for a big public art project in, um, in Michigan with over a thousand butterflies. So it's just, it really can go anywhere. There's no limits and um, able to create a whole different thing. Going back, that's why I decided to call this series latitude. Because latitude is, you know, both the distance from the equator, the distance from the thing, but it's it's freedom, scope of freedom of thought, freedom of action. And so I initially started with the, the butterflies and some birds and quickly decided that it was a much bigger idea and a lot more I wanted to do and applied that name latitude to the whole series. And now, like the bees are the most recent, honeybees are the most recent uh, addition to that, and I have a lot more things that I want to do with that, so look forward to that in the future. There's an author that wrote a book uh, called Start With Why, and he's, uh, he's kind of written a lot about how to do great work and how it is that we create things and, you know, kind of the way the human mind works and the best way to to do our best work and um, he he talks about in his book something that he calls the golden circle so it's these three different circles you can call it anything you like but it basically is the conversation about the three questions what how and why and for me I apply that of course to, here to art um, and for me, that's kind of this different, it, it's three different levels of appreciating art and three different levels of understanding art. Um, and I really feel like you can, you can appreciate art at any of the levels that you want to, but that truly good art has all three and therefore has a lot of depth. Okay, and I'm gonna explain to those. All right, so for me, what? What, I make sculptures. I create artwork that will enhance your home or environment. That is what I do. And that's fine, that's great, you know? Uh, how, I, my how is I study animals and I do my best to depict them as beautifully and as accurately as possible and hope that I can inform you about them. You know, like the monarchs, one of the big stories I like to tell about the monarchs is their epic migration that they do. Um, almost every animal, I can tell you different stories about that. I also use the best materials I can and I do traditional bronze casting, that's the how. I make sculptures with that knowledge and my education that I'm trying to give to you. All right, then the why, the very deep one. Um, for me, I am so deeply moved by the beauty of the natural world and that I wanna share that with you. And beyond that, I feel like art is what I have to give to the world. Those are my whys. All right, so kind of given the, the broad view of what, how, and why, I wanna go into a little bit more with that. Um, first of all, the what as a sculptor, I really think that this, sometimes this is a fine way to appreciate art. You, you, you're decorating a home. I hope that my pieces can enhance that environment, that are a beautiful thing that, that can add something to whatever space it is. Art does have the ability to transform a space. 
Okay, then the how. This is a little more interesting, and I feel like this I can almost spend whole days talking about this. Um, the how for me, again, is I study animals and I create bronze sculpture. Um, the casting process. Probably the most common question that I get is how is that made? And how do you make a bronze sculpture? And it is really fascinating. The study of casting, you can really see everything about you know civilizations as they've advanced. As soon as they learned how to work with metal, they were making sculptures, forging and casting. So that that study and that history is really interesting. Um, when I first discovered or became interested in bronze casting, I went to foundries and just poked into every corner like an adventurer. I went everywhere. I did wax pouring, molds, I did all those things. I've tried it all out. I was so fascinated. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, it probably is a big reason why I am a full-time artist because I could see the possibilities of the process. I could see the possibilities of the bronze casting techniques and it, it's the freedom it gave me to do anything I wanted. And that's what got me into bronze sculpting really in the first place. I'd always done art, but it was only when I really discovered um, sculpture. I love to make things, I'm tactile, that I said, no, this is what I have to do. And that's how I became a full-time artist, truly. Um, so that part of the how of how you do sculpture or how you do artwork is really truly fascinating. I'm happy to talk to anyone about that all the time. So <laughs> the other how I do have other hows um, is the how of the subject material. For me, the study of animals is absolutely fascinating. Um, I did grad studies as a wildlife biologist, so I can go on and on about how. Fish evolution, you know, led to our sensory perception of everything and, you know, feather morphology. I love that how. I can go there with you anytime you want, <laughs> forever. So, how can be really interesting. How is interesting. Um, I know many artists that kind of hang their whole persona on that. They, they have every feather in place. They have everything completely anatomically correct in the natural habitat. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but as I said, the, the, what, the what level of art is sort of a technician level of art. The how level of art is, is not a fully developed thing. That's a little bit more of a model maker for me, like something that would be in a um, natural history museum or something like that. So the most interesting that I'd love to spend the rest of my time talking about is the why. And for me, the why can, can be so many things. First of all, the why create art. Um, of all the amazing things that humans can do, the things we build and we've, one of the most elusive traits of humanity is that the spark of creativity. Like that's really one of the things that's so uniquely human. Uh, our brains take in everything, we combine it, you know, figure out what we can process it in a different way and output something totally uni unique and something that's very personal. That is the real magic. So even though art is maybe not necessary in the world, you know, some would say, I think it is the most necessary because it is one of the more uniquely human things that we can do, the true creativity. And creativity can be in any field. It can exist in any good work that's being done. But there are not many fields in which creativity is the stock and trade. That is the world of art, and that's why that's important. So that's a pretty heavy, deep, broad why. There, are, I have more specific whys for myself. Um, like I touched on earlier, one of my big whys is that I'm fascinated by animals, and I want to share that love with you. Um, I'm so moved by what I see in the natural world that I want to express it. I, I read somewhere a quote that I've always remembered, although I don't know who to attribute it to. They said, a writer is a reader moved to emulation. And I think maybe a, a, a broader explanation, explanation of that is an artist or anyone who does something creative is someone who's been moved by an experience and wants to express it in their own way. So that's the way I feel. I'm both moved by what I see and what I feel that I want to share that. Um, 
Okay, the, one of the last little whys I'm going to bother you with is that I feel like animals um, are the perfect stand-ins to be able to tell, tell any story. Many artists will, you know, use the human form and do it beautifully. Absolutely great art exists there, you know, some, perhaps some of the very best art. But for me, I feel like, at least from my own expression, that sometimes human, the human form as the subject is seen through so many of our different lenses of culture and history and, you know, even body image and things like that, that sometimes that clouds what the message can be or the message that I want to share. For example, if I want to do a piece that talks about strength, um, I could do a strongly muscled man, but you may see it as this, you know, muscled man and the way that person looks or not like me or whatever, you know, <laughs> or race or different lenses. For me, the most direct connection, or at least the way that I want to express that is through the animal form. So if I want to express strength, then maybe, um, I could do, you know, I would do a sculpture of a bull, you know, this animal that's just so strong, or the red-tailed hawk is another one that strength was a big message for me in that. Um, there's, there's really no limit to the way that animals can portray. You look at advertising and marketing and memes on social media, they're all stand-ins for us. We see the world through the animals. As well as, you know, feeling, I think we have a very deep connection to animals that allows us to, to have these stories that we tell through them. For me, art is important. For me, the animals are the way to tell that story. And that why, the big part of the why that I'm getting up to is that is how I tell you my stories, is through my artwork, through the animals. Um, I have things, you know, as humans, we all have stories that we want to share, and that is the medium in which I use to share with you. Um, just one little, let's see, I have one example I was going to, with the animal symbology, one other little kind of antidote I wanted to share. Um, the Arctic tern is a bird that flies from the North Pole to the South Pole every year. They do that whole, you know, navigation every year, 28,000 miles in a single year. So they literally go to the ends of the earth. So for me, I want to symbolize my love and my care for my children. That's the Arctic Turn. And on most of my sculptures, I can show you, I have a little stamp and there's an Arctic Turn wing on that sculpture. That's the kind of symbology that's possible with animals is they can, they can mean all those things. And that is the way I tell my stories. Well, okay, so I feel like we've kind of come full scope. I, I talked about the Latitude series, how that led from initially wanting to express animals and paring that down to the most essential element of it and eventually leading to the, the pieces that attach to the wall where you'd really true have the full latitude of expression. Um, where the room itself becomes part of the composition. It's not just a part from it. It is a piece of it and all the more freedom. And that's what I'm trying to do with all the art is just, that's what I think every artist is trying to achieve is more and more freedom of expression to really be able to tell those personal stories. Um, you have to have, oh, whoops. I don't know what I did there. Okay, I don't know how to fix it anyway. <laughs> You have to have all the levels in order to be able to create, to get to that very core. You have to know how to do the sculpture in, in order to be able to tell the story itself. Um, um, all right, and I think just to kind of sum it up, uh, as Allison was saying, I think I want to tell you the three levels, the full latitude of expression with a single piece, and that being the monarch butterflies. Um, so as I was kind of saying, as a design element, I think they work really beautifully because you make it part of the room. It's part of the composition instead of just something sitting on the pedestal. Um, very versatile and has been placed in a lot of really amazing spaces. So that's the what. The how. Um, 
just as Michael was saying, I had to figure out a lot of different ways to hang those. There's a lot of mechanical things and the casting process itself is not really geared to making multiples of small pieces, the foundry process. So in order to do that, I had to kind of develop some new um, methods to creating enough that you could create the feeling and creating enough that you could have the beauty of individual ones that expanded into the into the large things so that when you look up close it's beautiful but when you see it in a grander space so that's a very um, that was a challenging how to figure out for that piece um, the other how with the the monarch butterflies is um, their importance as as a pollinator species and they've really become a, a symbol for pollinator awareness and my hope with this and my love for the animals is that I can help raise awareness we take care of what it is that we know about and so if I can educate someone or just even interest them in um, the plight of the monarchs and their epic migration from you know Canada to Mexico every year then that would be, you know, my greatest hope is to be of some good in that way. So that is my how for the monarchs. Um, and then the why is kind of summed up. I, a lot of times when I am working on a piece, um, I create the, the why questions, even if I never share them. I, they don't always get told to everyone, and I think that's perfectly okay. You can access the art on any level that you want. Hopefully, um, good art has all those three different levels. And even if you never even hear about them, I feel like you can actually sense the depth in a piece. You know and create some sort of connection to it if you know that there's more to it than just, I can sculpt a bird. So, <laughs> you know, you, you want, y there must be that depth. Even if you don't want to see it, even if you don't want to hear about all the stories, I need to have them so that I'm creating it from my core outward instead of just making stuff. So when I do that, I often will write a small essay or, I don't know what I did there. All right. Okay, there we go. Last slide anyway. So I will often write a story that kind of gets to the deeper sense of the emotion or the feeling or the story that I want to tell. And so what I thought I would do to finish off is just read for you the story that I wrote about the monarchs. And I call the story Home. It's just a short essay and talks about my feelings of it. Home. In the highlands of the Sierra Madre, an entire generation of monarch butterflies patiently waits together for the winter to turn. Every butterfly from all across the continent clings to each other in long skeins from the limbs of ancient pines in a single grove on a remote mountain. They huddle together and let the dark season pass. In the spring, they use the last of their strength to fly north. They die and the next generation begins. Their children are born with the longing to wander until they also can go no further. Each generation answering the call to roam until the children's children's children of those butterflies that held each other in that distant mountaintop have gone so far and spread so wide that there is no more continent left for them to go. In the stillness at the edge of the world, a tiny spark ignites. They are finally far enough to hear the call of home. Inside their hearts, a compass finally wakens and the urge to escape is gone. A grove of pines where their ancestors once gathered summons them back, and from across the thousands of miles, the energy of travelers coalesces into the power of a new goal. None of them have ever seen it, but they know with certainty where they are meant to be, the spark of desire growing into the bright flame of purpose as they rush towards the place where they somehow know that they truly belong. Anyway, thank you. And I, I am happy to answer any questions if you want. What's next? What's next? <laughs> There's always next, yeah. Well, I do have several more things that I'm working on with the Latitude series. I'm really excited about that. Um, 
I have some bats that I'm working on, a couple new birds that I'm working on. This is a series that I may never finish with. Um, another next is that um, I did a lot of pieces, sort of the, my theme for myself for this year was about migration. It kind of started with the butterflies and then the hummingbirds were new for me this year. That was another one which I played around with that. I just completed a sandhill crane, which is kind of um, near and dear to my heart and then also really special for New Mexico. Um, that that it should be done sometime early next year. So that's another one of my new pieces coming out. <laughs> you yeah. Would you mind repeating that, Rick? Have you ever considered doing a series of dinosaurs or uh, vice age animals? Because I think they would be fantastic with your skills. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have actually. I don't know. I, I, I am interested in so many things. There's so many things that I want to do. Um, I'm fairly interested in the in fact this this tooth that I'm wearing is from an ice age dig in the Bering Sea. So I'm very interested in that kind of you know like early ice age, twenty thousand years ago, late Pleistocene stuff. But I ha I have to. I have to no, I can't do everything <laughs> and one of the things in which I think I may not ever be doing a nice thing is because a big part of me is a very personal connection to the animal I think if I could see a woolly mammoth that just like going across the tundra it would be done I might not ever sculpt anything else but <laughs> um, but th that missing component might hold me back I don't know maybe I'm fascinated by it <laughs> It would be fun. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back. Go back. Uh, so when you when you made the change from studying wildlife biology to uh, working as an artist. Was there anything specific, or was it just generally uh, um, a, a need to express yourself more? I love that question because it really does get at a lot of the things I was trying to talk about, like the the hows and whys. Um, always there for me is the need to create I'm a guy who just loves to dig in and make stuff I've always made something if I'm not you know always I can never remember a time um, and then always is the love of the animals in the wild places so that I feel like the study in biology was just a small outgrowth of it I grew up in a household in which art was not encouraged they were <laughs> you know it was to a degree like do it but that's not a career this is something to play with but don't get too serious about it um, and so it was always there and the biology was well this is something that fits within the my loves and my center that I can do I'll go do that uh, but then when I realized oh wait actually there are artists that are sculpting these animals that I love that sounds even better I'm gonna do that and I was just dumb enough or just naive enough to be like that'll be great I'm gonna go be an artist <laughs> And it worked out. So, anyway, does that answer what you're saying? Yeah. Do you have a story for every sculpture you've created? Um, like you do with the monarchs? Yeah, pretty much. I do. They're not all big, full, written out essays. A lot of times it can just be a, a motion that I have. Um, a, a piece or just a, a feeling like um, the red tail hawk is kind of a good example of that I didn't write up an essay or have a particular story I wanted to tell but it was a time in which I was you know the kind of as with many creatives you know, a certain amount of self-doubt or whatever and just wanting to feel strong and powerful feel that defiance and confidence and so I did a piece to embody that um, so there, if there's not a story, there is at least 
very much a an emotion behind it so yeah and i and uh, hopefully i get the chance to share some of those stories with you you know like i said you don't have to know those about every piece i don't even always tell those pieces but i feel like having them there creates that depth that you can sense and i'm happy to interact with people on any of those levels any latitude is fine <laughs> Are you going to do a dragonfly latitude series? <laughs> so I like that a lot. I've actually, as you know, have sculpted a dragonfly. Um, I, one of my particular interests in biology was entomology. So like the honeybees and the butterflies. And um, I'm still working with a way to, one of the challenges with the honeybees as with some of the smaller insects is having enough artistic impact to each one of the individual elements. Um, the honeybees on their own don't have a presence enough, and this is something Denise and I talked about earlier in the year, they needed, they, they needed more of a presence to carry it as a complete piece of art instead of a trinket that sits on the door, on the tabletop. And the same, like I am, I. I I would love to do something with that, and I've kind of got some things brewing. But yeah, possibly. Yeah. I just need to figure out the supporting way to make that have a little more impact. How do you decide if a sculpture is going to be produced in bronze or in stainless steel? Stainless steel has much different properties than bronze and the end result looks completely different. So how do you, how do you decide whether to create it in bronze or stainless steel? So I like that question too. I don't know that I've been asked that directly like that, but um, that the stainless steel versus bronze thing is kind of um, exists in the how realm of questions. I'm really fascinated by the casting process. I truly can go on all day about all the different things that go into it. And casting stainless steel is this whole new challenge. It's a very difficult metal to work with as compared to bronze. Bronze is very easy. Um, and it just, but the challenge is there as well as this whole different look how it can change something that's kind of a warm and sweet piece to this bright and exciting piece so that's an exploration of just these different ways of expressing even the same sculpture in a couple different emotions um, that's where that one exists <laughs> and some I like with both it's it's fun to be able to say two things with, with the same story in a, in a way does that answer yeah Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. This is a really wonderful group and I, I appreciate all of you and give me the chance, thanks. <laughs>